Hi, everybody. And hello, England, the birthplace of my father. Finally made it there when I was 61. So that day was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Just standing, looking at myself in the mirror. It was, I couldn't go past that day anymore and pretend that my life was okay. I'd been with my second husband 23 years. It was very dull and boring, but I just knew how to play happy families. And so I just did that. And then here I am looking at myself in the mirror and it was like, it's wake up day. So I went to Chris and I told him what had just happened and said, look, I need to do something about it. What are we going to do? And he said, well, I understand where you're coming from. Why don't we just start again? And it was like, oh, what exactly do you mean? I thought. So I said, okay, so if you were to ask me to marry you again, the answer would be yes, but don't ask me if it's not what you want. So a few days later, he asked me. And so we decided to renew our vows and start again. We weren't exactly sure how our life was going to go at that point. We owned a chiropractic clinic. So we just decided to put our house on the market and see what would happen. And it sold in five days. So it was like, you're moving. <laughs> we didn't know where to at that point. So it got us thinking and we decided that we'd sell the clinic and um, go on a kind of a honeymoon. Uh, to Europe because his father's from Italy and mine was from England and we would come back and buy a four-wheel drive and a caravan and go chiropracting around Australia and I just thought oh my god my life is like it's turning around you know I've, I've made a decision and this thing's going to happen and I was so excited. Um, two weeks later I went to Canada because my daughter had had a baby and while I was over there he rang me and told me that it was all over so here I have this like till death do us part plan of being with this man and all of a sudden it's just gone. Everything about the future of my life just got wiped out. And when I came back to Australia, we had to pack up all the stuff in our house and I'm, I was just like shattered. I was shopping one day and I thought, oh my God, this is going to be me shopping for one. And I'm the youngest of six and I left home to get married. Between two marriages, I looked after the children. And now here I am about to be on my own for the first time in my life. And I'm 61. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know if you can imagine what that's like, but it was pretty surreal. So I had a little meltdown in the shopping aisle of the supermarket, I had a bit of a cry. And I thought, whoa. This, I, I can't carry on like this either. I'd been pretty much a victim my whole life. And I'm thinking like, yeah, but I'm on my own. It's like, I don't, I don't know how to be on my own. And this other little voice is going, yeah, but you've got no one else to tell you what to do. And it's like, yeah, but that's half the problem. It's like, I've never had to make decisions. I didn't have to take responsibility. There was always somebody else in my life to do that. And this little voice sort of said, oh, come on, you know, you love adventure. You've got the chance of a lifetime. You've got your marriage settlement money. You can go and do whatever you want. So I'm six, I was 61 at the time, right? So I've spent my whole life being looked after by family, husband, and then another husband. So it was like I'd been in retirement for 60 years, and now all of a sudden I I'm like a teenager who has to leave home. <laughs> and I was probably as scared as a teenager who had to leave home as well, because I'd never had to look after myself and, and figure out all those just ordinary decisions and everything now was going to be my responsibility, everything. That's really frightening when you've never really done that. So anyway, so I had some marriage settlement money, quite a lot, not a huge amount, but enough. And I thought, well, what the heck am I going to do? So we'd booked this honeymoon, this four months to Europe, and I just decided to go by myself. And I'd never traveled. I'd been to Canada and back, but that was just like a one-off trip. But this was like my overseas experience that everyone else was having when they were like 20 in, in their 20s. So off I went. And it was just the most incredible experience of my life to go around Europe and England. My son was living in England, so I got to catch up with him. I got to go to Canada and catch up with my daughter. But it, it was 
for people who like when you live down in Australia and New Zealand, it's a really long way to go up to the northern hemisphere. And we only have really English and it's Australian English or New Zealand English. And you might go to Bali or Fiji or, you know, some little trip, but it's a major excursion to go up to Europe. So here I am living in, in backpackers and getting around however. And I'm just kind of walking around with my mouth open, ogling at all these architectural masterpieces that I'd only ever seen in pictures or on the movies. So it was just a, a magnificent time for me. But at the end of that, I had to come back to Australia. And I don't know if you can imagine what that was like. I just said, I actually extended my trip to five months. And all of a sudden, I've got to come back to Australia and I've got no home. I've got no husband. I've got no job. And I've got no car. And I didn't really have any family, supportive family around either. And I just absolutely crashed and went into a pretty deep depression. And I was lying on my bed one day and I thought, oh my God, what if this is the last day of my life? And I looked back on my life and I thought, I've just done nothing. I've spent my whole life being afraid, trying to stay safe, avoiding conflict, just pretty much doing what I'm told. And what if this was my last day? And it was just like a slap in the face. And I just, I felt the regret of having, of not having lived a life that was true to who I was, but I didn't really know who I was. I kind of got to experience that when I was in Europe and I realized that I was actually a lot more capable by myself than I thought. So I went searching on the internet and I came across an article called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. It was written by an Australian woman who was looking after um, people when they were dying. And I had four out of five of those regrets. And it was like, whoa, I've got to do something about it. So it was at that point I started to kind of get focused. And I thought, right, my first need is to go and get a car. I've never bought a car either, you know, like I had to do it by myself. <laughs> And so I bought this little Subaru Impreza hatch and I made sure that I could sleep in the back because I didn't have a home and I didn't know where I wanted to be. And I was starting to feel kind of restless. You know, I didn't want to go back to the life that I'd had. So I made sure I could sleep in it. And then I thought, well, what am I going to do with my life? I, I was a school teacher. I don't want to be a school teacher. I don't have any other skills, really. I'd been a housewife and mother most of my life. And so I ended up going down to Sydney to some courses and learned how to be a coach and a speaker. So I hopped in my car one on the March the 9th, 2017. And with the music cranked up really loud, I took off. I got half, I got half an hour down the road and I was so exhausted <laughs> I had to pull over because I didn't leave till just after midnight. And I just opened the front door, hopped out, got on the back door and had a sleep and carried on down. So when I was down in Sydney, one of the questions that we got asked in the, in the coaching course was like, who's your avatar going to be? Who, who do you want to work with? And it was like, I had no idea really. So they gave us a big long list of ideas. And I wrote, I saw one of them that just stuck out and it said lost and directionless. And I thought, that's me. That's who I've been, lost and directionless. And so I decided to work with women over 60 who were also lost and directionless. And probably the hardest thing has been keeping myself coming out of being in my cave. Um, it's very easy to slip back into your comfort zone. And I discovered when I was 57, I pushed back the length of New Zealand from the bottom to the top. And I realized on that ride that the best fun you can ever have is just outside your comfort zone. But most of us kind of get stuck in our comfort zone. So that's been kind of like my biggest challenge. So part of overcoming that for me was to just keep driving in my car. I didn't realize I was going to live in my car. I lived in it for nearly three years. And it's, it's only my head touches the back of the driver's seat and my feet touch the end of the car. So it's not like it's really roomy. <laughs> I had to create a mud mat because I could never find where anything was because I've always been a little bit messy. Um, so I just started driving 
And I had a cooker, I had to find toilets. Um, I had no shower. Actually, at that point, I didn't even have a cooker. I started off using barbecues by the beach. I swam, like a lot of Australia is very hot, but, but still when I was down south, I still swam in the sea to have a shower. I'd often go into um, uh, toilets in the, you know, disabled toilets, they're really big and I could lock the door and put a towel down, strip off and have a good wash. Um, I was even known to go into a caravan park and look and see if I could find the the um, the amenities, and they all had these little push button locks on, so I couldn't get in. So I was about to leave when I saw a woman heading towards it, and I thought I'm going to follow her in. So she opened the door, and I just followed her, and I had no towel or anything with me, so I just stripped off in the shower, I used my singlet to dry myself, put my clothes back on, and left. So I became very innovative. And probably one of the biggest things that I learned is how many signs there are out there just guiding us. And when you're busy and a bit depressed and you're pretending that everything's fantastic, you don't see those signs. But the more I traveled by myself, the more I just, I woke up to all the different things that were going on around me. I'd turn the radio on and a song would play something and it would just crack me up. And then I got an opportunity to do a TED talk and I had to make, it was a big decision because I'd never done anything like that, stepping out. And the day that I made that decision to do that TED talk, I was kind of like a bit shaky. And I had two computers and my phone and a fridge that I plugged into the, um, into the cigarette lighter. So I went into this pub up in the north of Australia and asked if I could plug all my things in. And they said, sure. And then I thought, damn it, I'm going to go and have a beer. It was like 11 o'clock in the morning. And um, so I went up to the bar. And can you believe it? There was a beer on tap called Ted. And I had never seen of Ted, never seen or heard of Ted beer. And I thought, yeah, now that's a sign. <laughs> so I had a pint of Ted. And then the next day, I was at these markets. And this woman pulled up, this old woman, and she needed to go to the toilet. And she had a dog in the back of the car, and she was a bit concerned about her dog. And she just said to me, look, would you mind just keeping an eye on my dog? And I said, of course I will. I love animals. And I said, what's his name? And she said, Ted. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, I just cracked up. And then the following week, I'd gone um, back down to Sydney, and I was staying in a, in a um, youth hostel. And I was talking to my roommate and we're just chatting about our lives and what we're doing. And hostels are amazing because people come from all over the world. And if, if I was in a hotel, it would just be me. But I'm in this youth hostel meeting people from everywhere. Like all through Europe, I stayed in youth hostels. But this one's in Sydney. And we got chatting. She said, she said, oh, my God, you should do a TED talk. And I was like, OK, I'll do that. <laughs> and I thought, OK, three signs. I'm on the right track. And those kind of things happened everywhere I went. And the other beautiful thing is I learned that I was friendly and I never had been. People scared me. I didn't have a good time growing up. I couldn't look anybody in the eye. I was always feeling like I just was such a nobody that, that I don't know, there was just no presence about me. And then as I got hip, happier and more confident, I was looking everybody in the eye. I started smiling and and I needed to meet people. It's like, well, where do you go to meet people when you live in your car? And I didn't go to all the camping grounds. I would just pull up on the side of the road and hop in the back of my car and sleep. I could sleep anywhere because my car's so small, it never looked like a, anyone would be sleeping in it. And I started going to pubs because I love sports. So I'd go to a pub in the weekend and there'd be bands. So I'd get up and dance and I'm the only old person dancing. <laughs> Gradually, people would get up and dance and, and the more alcohol people had, the freer they became. And I was there without any alcohol at all. And then I'd end up dancing with all these young people. And then some of these weird things started happening. I'd never had a good relationship with boys. You know, I was always too introverted, but I was sporty. So, you know, that was hanging out with sporty people was okay. And then all of a sudden these young guys started coming up and talking to me and sometimes asked me to dance. And it wasn't like they were flirting. It wasn't anything like that. It was all of a sudden I felt like I was just somebody who was open and free and they just wanted to talk to me. 
it was the most beautiful thing. And this one guy came and said, can I talk to you about my relationship? And it's like, sure. <laughs> so we sat down and he started pouring his heart out about relationship. And I think these kids just, they've got no more idea now than I had back then. And here I am with, I'm in my 60s. And now I feel like I've got some wisdom that I want to share. And this guy said, oh, can you talk to my girlfriend? And it's like, sure, bring her over. So I'd sit there and just just have these conversations. And then one day I went to um, Burley Heads, which is in the Gold Coast where I lived. And I went to the pub there this one night. I don't get flashed up, you know, like I just wear what I feel comfortable in. And I was going up the stairs into the pub and this guy was coming down and he took one look at me. He put his hand out and he said, you're coming with me. And it was like, okay, <laughs> like I stopped saying no, or this is weird, or this isn't right here. I'm old, he's young. I just started to allow life to flow and unfold before me. And it's just been the most magical journey. And that's basically what I'm doing now. I've started a website. I don't look after it and I don't really know what to do with it, but it's called after60.com.au. And the whole point of the rest of my life is what is possible for people when you get over 60. We have a lot of very staid viewpoints as from the time when viewpoints were pretty, yeah, now you talk about it as being politically incorrect. And there were some terrible things that went on when I was young. So I really look forward to opening the conversation up between young people, old people in between, and, and let's just get honest. So I love what Kelly said about when you're honest, you've got nothing more to hide. You've got no lies to cover up. You can just be yourself. So that's kind of what I'm doing for the rest of my life. I've got ideas coming out my head that I don't quite know what to do with, but with Gertrude's help, I'm going to get there. Um, I'm going to be doing a workshop when they do the workshops in April, um, all about this. And then the ending of my story is that one day in September 2019, and I'm just loving life, and I guess it's just shining out of me, and I walked into... Um, the North Burley Surf Club to watch the Australian Rugby League finals. And I sat down at a table and there was Jeff. <laughs> the love of my life. And I am still with him. We're getting married. And that's all another story. So that's me. Thank you for listening. I've got no idea how long I spoke. <laughs> Thank you.